your first time here, we just want to say I'm so grateful that you came, that you are here today with us. And just want to let you know that it is really our deep desire that you would experience God in this place. That's it, that you would simply experience God. And so at the end of the service, my wife and I would love to have a, an opportunity to introduce ourselves, to, take, to get to know you a little bit. And uh, our goal is just two minutes and we'll get you on your way. All right, awesome. And uh, secondly, that before I preach, if you can turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis 39, is where we at, the book of Genesis. While you're turning there, I just want to let you know that after the second service today, we are going to have a day to engage. It's that time where the younger generation and the older generation are encouraged to engage and to really learn from each other. Uh, because this is our part of our vision, is to really understand each generation. And so asking the question, what can we do together to advance the kingdom of God? And so we want to engage. Um, uh, that's happening after the second service. Genesis chapter 39 is where we are today. And uh, what we're going to do, friends, is we are going to... Uh, just follow me. We're going to skip. A, we're not going to read the whole thing. But I'm going to just skip and just follow me. I'm going to tell you which verse to go to. Okay? Ver, uh, chapter 39, verse 1. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Uh, uh, Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So... Just understanding the background of the story, Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers. By his own brothers. And so you just imagine the dysfunctional uh, that his family uh, was. And selling Joseph into slavery was kind of a somewhat just brutal. And then verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. So that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found, found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Now, look at this. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Uh... And then, verse 5, from the time he put him in charge of his household, and all and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, in the verse... In verse 19, so the story basically goes that Potiphar's wife had a thing with Joseph. And uh, so uh, she wanted Joseph to just sleep with him. And Joseph was like, no way. I mean, how can I do such a thing and sin against my God? And so Potiphar's wife, you know, somehow uh, made a big scene and lied about the whole thing. And Joseph ended up in prison. Right? He was innocent. But look at this. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your, your slave treated me. You know, tried to rape me, whatever. All a lie. He burned with anger, the master. Joseph master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But look at this. But while Joseph was there in the prison, here we go, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he, made, he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So... The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the vision 2019, and 
we began this journey with just really the most important uh, thing that we need to understand is this got to be right. Your relationship with God must be right. Because if this is not right, nothing else will go right in your life, I guarantee you that. And so if this is, a, if this is right, then we work here, our relationship with others. So relationship really is vital. Our relationship with God and relationship with others is really important. Now, the second thing that we talked about is bridging the gap. You know, how do you find two generations, uh, the, the old and the younger generations, to start engaging and really asking the question, what can we do to advance the kingdom of God instead of constantly, in, uh, constantly disengage and, and not, you know, really trying to compete with each other and not really understanding each other. And so we just got to bridge the gap. It's time. Uh, and then we got to somehow empower, to find a way to empower everyone. And, to, and folks, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you are not engaged, I just want to let you know that Matthew 25 tells us that you don't want to bury your, the talents and gifts that God has given you. You've got to use it to advance the kingdom of God. That's just biblical. And so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, whether you're young or old, and you know, I'm so proud of Pastor Geraldine, the fact that he, that she is using even the children to help her in ministry. In fact, she is going to take four young people, uh, or children, not young people, children, and she is going to mentor them four. And, and why? Because we just know this, that it doesn't matter... What age, whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter. You have the talents and gifts that God has given you, according to Matthew 25. You've got to use it uh, for the kingdom of God. And then we've got to equip. we got to start equipping people. We can't say, hey, here's, here's, uh, here's a job for you, or oh, here's a ministry for you, and you figure it out. No, we're not going to do that. We, are, uh, we will be committed to making sure... That you are equipped to do what you're called to do. Whatever it takes. And today, I want to talk to you about this uh, last thing. Reaching the potential. Reaching the potential. I remember when I was uh, going to school, uh, when I was going to grade school a couple of years ago. Uh, we were given one of the three marks for our achievement. Maybe some of you that are older, uh, you would understand this. Uh, remember those times when you don't really get an A or B, but you get the, the word outstanding, satisfactory, and the last thing is unsatisfactory, right? And uh, so I remember that we would, we would frequently compare our results, right? Or how many O's you get, how many S you get, and then we don't talk about the U, the, right? Uh, the unsatisfactory. And, uh, and it's funny because we never brag about the use, right? We don't brag about, oh, look at me. I got a lot of unsatisfactory. I'm just good. No, you don't. And, uh, but for me personally, I was good with satisfactory. I mean, I don't care about, oh, I mean, those are for the geeks. And so I'm just good with the ass, right? I'm just good with an ass. But my aunt who took care of me, she didn't want me to just settle for an S. She wanted me to pursue the O, outstanding. But I was like, my attitude was like, I'm good with an S. And so I was just average. I was satisfied with satisfactory. And, uh, and here's the thing. Just like me, if a student becomes content with a satisfactory effort, he will rarely pursue himself to earn an O for outstanding. That was me. The same is true in life, friends. Is that if a person becomes content with what is average, which many is satisfied, she will miss out on how God truly created them to be. You see, God created you and me in His image and likeness is what He said in the book of Genesis, right? We know that. There is, and if God has created you and me in His image and likeness, now let me ask you this. Is there anything average about God? Come on. Is there anything average about God? Thank you. Love 
the fact that you're engaging with me this morning. And uh, the person who is good with average will rarely make the effort to pursue truly what is excellent or outstanding for Jesus. In the vast majority of cases, the longer a person remains satisfied with the string of S marks in her life or her uh, uh, or his life, the more she becomes complacent about life, going through the motions to achieve satisfactory results becomes the norm. It becomes the norm. And here's the thing, friends. If you look at the book of Acts, which is part of our journey this year, uh, I don't know about you, but I can see that the church, the, the people, the followers of Jesus Christ were so effective, were so influential, and the power of the New Testament church was, was so evident. Would you not agree? I mean, you just know that there's so much more, that there's so much more for us as God's people than we are cur- currently experiencing, right? There's so much more. And uh, that leaves us with two options today. Number one, we can accept things the way they are, be satisfied with what's happening with our lives, be satisfied with our shallow relationship with God, be good enough while we were at in life and rationalize things, why God doesn't move a certain way anymore. I mean, we can do all of that. Or the second is that we can seek out answers and aim to get rid of anything that is stealing our potential. I don't know about you, friends, but just imagine this for a moment, being average, an average Christian life. Who wants that? Really? Who wants an average Christian life? Who wants an average relationship with God? Did anybody woke up today and say, man, I'm satisfied with my relationship with God? Because if you are, come, please come see Pastor Rocky. <laughs> an average church life? Who wants an average church life? Who wants an average worker for God? With an average service? Who wants being average, just being a student of the Word of God? What about prayer life? Just average prayer life. Average disciple of Jesus. An average life. Right? An average wife. An average husband. An average dad. An average mom. An average student. An average worker. Whatever. I mean, really. Who wants to live average? But somehow, we, 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 that's, where, that's where we're at. A lot of us just living average. And worse, sometimes some people are living below average. I just don't understand how we could live average when we see the Word of God. I get it, friends. The world is brutal. Sometimes the the world is just mean. I get it. The storm that comes in our lives... Sometimes, a lot of times, it's brutal. We're pretty beat up in life. I get that. I was. I was beat up. But then I came to know Jesus. And we sang about the power in His name. And that He broke every chain in my life. And I'm standing in front of you today, just because, not because of me, but because of what God has done in my life. Period. What did I do? It's simply faith. It's simply faith. And it's a daily thing. It's not a one-time faith. It's a daily thing. And um, so a good example of this, friends, is Joseph. Joseph understood that God created created him so much more. Uh, And the fact that this is not the plan of God and never his will for us to be average. And Joseph understood this. It is never in God's will for us to be satisfied or just being average in life. And Joseph understood it. While he was a slave, he excelled in every way that his master had put him in charge of everything. And then he was accused of something he was innocent, innocent of and ended up in prison. He also excelled in every way that the prison warden had placed him in charge of all the other prisoners. 
this is what we saw about about Joseph's life. I mean, and then I can go on and and on about Moses, who was a murderer, right? I mean, he basically took off and he was just, was wandering in the desert for so many years, and finally God called him, and guess what? He became the the leader in Israel. Jacob was a thief. He was a deceiver. Right? I mean, how God took his life and changed him. And he became, guess what? The father of all the 12 tribes in Israel. I mean, Paul was a murderer. He was a religious man, but also a murderer. He was, he was basically going after the Christians. I mean, he was a bad guy, bad religious guy, right? And God took his life and changed him. And guess what? He became one of the greatest apostles of all time. He wrote about 13 books in the Bible. Come on now. Peter was a fisherman. And the fact that he was basically a nobody during that time. But then God took his life and, and molded him and changed him. And then he, began, he began, began this journey with Jesus. And he became one of the greatest apostles of all time. And the key to Joseph's life. The key, and I'm going to show you the key, is this. In Genesis 30, 30, 39, 2. It should be on the screen. The Lord was what? Was with Joseph. Because the Lord was with, was with Joseph that he what? Prospered. And that he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with them. That's why he prospered. And then the second thing, look at this. In verse 21, the Lord was with him. Now in prison. Showed him kindness and granted him, what, favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The Lord was with him. Friends, the first thing I want to remind you is this, is who you have. Who you have. In the book of John, chapter 14, 6, tells us this. I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you, what? Forever. Right? That means today, he's still with you. He's still available to help you until today. It wasn't back in Jesus' day. Then he said this, he said, he will be with you forever, until today, and tomorrow, and next year, and five years from now, ten years from now, until you and I are dead, he will be with us. All right? That he may be with you forever, that is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because why? He abides with you, and will be in you. So who you have, understanding who you have, friends, is important. Who you have, understanding that is vital in your, in your Christian life. We have God, the Holy Spirit, in us. Right? So if the Holy Spirit is in us, why in the world are we going to settle for anything less? It's to live average. It, do, it doesn't make sense. Would you not agree? Because there's nothing about the Holy Spirit, that, that, there's nothing about Him that is average. Nothing. He is the one who created the world and the universe and the galaxies. I mean, come on. He, he is the one who created everything. There's nothing average about your God who lives in you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, he, he's your opportunity that if you believe in Jesus today and you surrender your life and you ask Him to forgive you and you repent of your sins, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will come and He will live in you and He will transform your life, that He will do some extraordinary, extra, uh, incredible, exceptional things in your life if you believe in Him. And we have God, right? And a lot of times we act as if we don't. We go to work. We work average. 
We come to serve God in, in the church. We come and we serve Abby. Uh, we come and there's an opportunity to engage in worship. And we worship as if our worship to God does not matter. Um, we have the capacity, folks, to be exceptional and to live extraordinary because of who you have and who I am. Exceptionally, the way we live for Jesus. Excellent relationship with God and people. Admirable servants. Incredible time of just worshiping Jesus. Prayer life, extraordinary. Outstanding student of the Word of God, right? We could achieve that. And we could be at that place simply because of who you have. The second thing is what you have. What you have. Who you have, the Holy Spirit, and what you have. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come to what? Give you life. And life abundantly. What you have is what? Is life. Of who? Of Christ. The defeated hell, grave, and death. The one who died on the cross but rose from the grave after the third day. Ascended into heaven and now seated at the right hand of the Father. you got to understand, friends, that what is important is understanding who you have and what you have. Are you with me? Because the life of Christ that is so victorious, friends, allows us to live more than average. The life of Christ allows me to live exceptionally, extraordinary, in excellent way, in, in, in some incredible ways. The life of Christ is like, listen to this, the life of Christ is like the vehicle that would take me to places. But the Holy Spirit is like the engine that would help the vehicle to get me to those places. Let me repeat. The life of Christ is like the vehicle that would take me to places. But the Holy Spirit is like the engine that would help the vehicle to get me to those places. The Holy Spirit and the life of Christ that is in us allows me and you to have the attitude of the next thing is the can-do attitude. Because of who I have and, and, and who and, and what I have. So who I have and what I have allows me to say, I can do it. I can do it. And Philippians 4.13 tells us this, I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. Is that what it says? I can do some things? No. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you just imagine for a moment that if you wake up every single day, every morning, and just saying, man, I can, uh, you know, I know that I have some challenges in my life and storms is real. Right? But what if we start saying, I can do all things through Christ. In the midst of all of that, I can do it. I can live righteously. I can live with, with honoring God. I can live in worshiping Jesus. I can, I, I can go to work in spite of what I feel. I can be the best worker for Jesus. And, and, Jesus, and by the way, the Bible says, work as if you're working for who? For the Lord. Right? So you go to work. And you would just an attitude instead of, ah. Oh. And then you just kind of expose that attitude. And then all of your coworkers like, uh, okay. What if we go to work and just say, man, I just praise God that I have a job. I praise God that I have the ability that God has given me to work and to provide for my family. I appreciate the fact that I'm not going hungry. The fact that I have, I can, you know, put... Uh, some food on my table, the fact that there's so many billions and billions of people that are dying every single day simply because they don't have anything to eat and clean water. Man, I praise God that I have shower, that I can just turn on any faucet, and I can just drink from that, clean water, and I can take a shower for 30 minutes, and that bothers me, by the way. Hey, if you're taking a shower for, for more than five minutes, 
uh, I, it bothers me because I'm reminded of the people in Haiti. I mean, and here we are in America. Right? I, so I, I've learned how to take a shower in five minutes. Just because I, I used to take a shower 20, 30 minutes until I went to Haiti. It changed my life because I see these children and people. You know what they're drinking? You don't want to know. You don't. And uh, that, that was the first time I heard a military shower. And what is that? You sweat yourself for 10 seconds. And then you turn it off. You put on the soap. And you've got 20 seconds to drink. And you don't open your mouth. Like, oh, there is an awesome one. No. You're going to die. So I got back here, I said, I'm making a commitment to take a shower five minutes or less. And I do. That's my life. I do take a good shower. So how I got to that, I don't know. Water. Water is connected to can do attitude. And uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God gave me the Holy Spirit. God gave me His life that allows me to say, I can do it. I can do it. So let me ask you this. Is there any indication that living a life of average is really acceptable to God? No. Right? Because in the book of Acts, you can see that the church was a powerhouse. Everybody was living extraordinary and exceptional. Acts 4.13 was one of these incredible stories about Peter and John. Uh, they were before the, the, these religious people. And the religious people, they began to observe something different about these two people, Peter and John. Now, look at this. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were what? An educated and untrained men or unschooled, right? They were amazed and began to recognize why? Because they were with Jesus. They were with Jesus. There's something about being with God. Being led by God and being used by God. You can't ever forget who we have and the life we have that allows us to say, I can do that. We have the Holy Spirit and Jesus has given us his life to defeat in hell, grave, and death, right? Um, there's a person who came to this country with absolutely no English, just yes or no. Probably. Or a little bit, a little bit more. But that's it. And later on, you know, his life basically uh, was a mess and he comes to know Jesus and he becomes a pastor and a pastor that he is he's now pastoring is pretty multi-ethnic and he, he, he now serves as one of the executive presbyter for the district of the Assemblies of God and the president for the Filipino American Assemblies of God National and this is a person that did not speak any English when he came here. And took over a church that is completely Filipino, is now a multi ethnic You're looking at it. You're looking at it. And do you know why? I simply said, I know who I have. I know what I have. That allows me to say, I can do it. The danger about this, friends, is this, is that we need to be careful to pursue being excellent with our kingdom nature. The danger is that if we pursue something excellent for self-gain, that's dangerous. We can only be truly successful and satisfied in the will of God. When our lives are completely surrendered to Him, don't be pursuing something excellent for self-gain. You will get in trouble. 
And friends, let me just encourage you with this. God wants us to pursue these things, you know, excellent and, and, and ex- being extraordinary and all this stuff in godliness. In godliness. So what's the whole purpose of this? What's the whole purpose to really understand that you and I are encouraged by God to reach our potential? What's the whole purpose? So that you and I can build our ego? So that you can, you and I can be prideful and so that you and I can say, oh, look at me. For self-gain, all of this stuff? No, God forbid. The whole purpose is so that you and I can honor God and so that you and I can glorify His holy. God is glorified in my life. It's simply because of what He has done. I'm telling you, what God has done in my life should tell you, wow, God is so good to see. How He took His life and transformed it. And how He created beauty out of out of His broken life. The glory of God belongs to God. He did all these things in my life. It, it's not so that I can say, oh, look at me, I'm just so good. No, no, God will do it. He did all these things in my life simply because for one purpose. And that purpose is this. To give him all the glory. Are you with me? And so, you would agree with me that we really don't want to be an average person, an average Christian, an average church, an average whatever, right? You and I are called to really pursue something so excellent, excellent, and extraordinary, but we do it in government. So, inside your bulletin, you'll see the five key principles about your potential. And uh, when you have the time later on, read through that, and uh, that would help you to really understand about your the principles about your potential. And so let me just end with this. The vision 2019 is a relationship with God and a relationship with others, bridging the gap between the two generations, empowering everybody to do the work of God, and then equipping, and then today, reaching our full potential individually and as a church. Being extraordinary, being excellent, exceptional in every way, and application is this. The application number one is you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. That's the first thing. You've got to believe that this is God's will for you. That you are called to live extraordinary. You're, you, that you are called to live exceptionally. God is not going to settle for anything ever. He's not. He's not. We just, we, we saw that. And then number two is that you've got to walk in it by faith. It takes faith to do this. Faith in God. That you can do this. You are called to do this. So do you have the faith to say yes to Jesus? To really live extraordinary and to live exceptionally? Are you going to say yes, enough is enough? I'm going to pursue an excellent marriage. I'm going to pursue just being excellent, uh, having an excellent uh, family. I'm going to pursue just, you know what, just being excellent for Jesus when I serve Him. I'm going to just pursue excellence when I study the Word of God, when I pray, when I worship. I'm just going to do everything exceptionally because of who I have and what I have that allows me to say, I can do it. I can do it. And then number three, you've got to do the work. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the work. You got to believe it. You got to walk in it by faith, and you got to do the work. It takes a lot of work to accomplish these things, but it's time for us to do it and to do it together. The leadership will be committed to helping you, making sure that you are doing it, that you are not settling for average, that you are not settling for as satisfactory, just like when I was in grade school. No, no, no. We are going to hold each other accountable to say it's time for us to live exceptionally, extraordinary. And as a church, it's time for us to really impact lives and to really influence them for Jesus Christ. Are you with me?
And then lastly, you got to stay the course. You got to stay the course. There will be times that we will be distracted or that we want to give up or we, we just want to settle for average. We can't. We cannot afford it. We need to hold each other accountable just like I, I said earlier. We got to stay the course. We got to. We got to look at Jesus. Living righteously in all holiness, living in very honorable life, fighting for injustice, speaking God's truth in love and compassion, sharing the gospel, going after the things of God and doing its work with audacity, and really just being exceptional and extraordinary in every way for Jesus. Are you with me? And the result is this, friends. The result is Galatians 6, 9. Look at this. Let us not become weary on doing what is good, for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. You will reap a harvest. You will reap a harvest. And so, friends, we have, I believe that today, we have a message that is very challenging. And I really hope and pray that you're not going to go and leave this church to go back to being average. There's nothing average about God. Nothing average about Him. And He did not call you and me to live average. That's why my wife and I continue to pursue bringing help and growing in our relationship. And that's why we, my, our children and with my wife are constantly engaging of how we could do better as a family. That's why the pastoral team are all constantly talking about how can we make our church better. That's why I'm asking myself every single day, how can I be better as a husband, as a father, as a, as a leader, and all of that? Because I'm called. I realize of who I have and, and, and what I have that allows me to say, I can do it. Do you see this? Would you bow your hands and close your eyes?